First of all, I want to say that in taking one photograph, a good photographer is really taking two. One with the camera in his hands and one with the visual imagination. The photograph in his head is a photograph of his idea of the sitter and he needs perception and his study to have the idea. The other is easy, but the two photographs have to be superimposed, one on the other, in some peculiar and unexplainable way at the moment when the camera clicks, and that is very hard indeed. Being fatally drawn to the human race, what I want to do when I photograph it is to make a revelation about it, so my sitters turn into my victims. But I would like to add that it is only those with a demon, however small and of whatever kind, whose faces lend themselves to being victimised at all. So this is the first two paragraphs from Deakin's text that he wrote for a prospective uh, exhibition of eight portraits, so it's called the text for eight portraits. Um, after this he goes through the eight portraits and talks about how he knows the, the subjects and, and what the image kind of means to him, but the, the first two paragraphs seem to illustrate something quite interesting. I think you spotted originally, I had actually missed the subtle association that there might be in these kind of lines to the double exposures. It's quite interesting for thinking about how he is conceiving of every image that he takes as being a superimposition, about having an idea that's in his head and then having something which is actually in the camera. Um, because in the photographs themselves, I suppose, there's something slightly different happening, where it's implied that there might be two aspects to the person presenting themselves, rather than necessarily him thinking about how he's conceiving mm -hmm. it. And I suppose the photographs are doing both of those things at the same time. They're sort of about his framing of the shot, but mm -hmm. also the person's framing of themselves. When you read the text, you're saying the two photographs have to be superimposed one another in some peculiar and unexplainable way at the moment when the camera clicks. It seems to allude to the process, but also it seems to be slightly disingenuous because he's allowing some magic to be introduced into his conception of the process. A peculiar and unexplainable way, it is actually possible to explain what he's doing when he does a double exposure. So there's some sort of magical positioning there, mm. which is quite interesting when he goes on to discuss about he wants to reveal a demon in people. That's kind of like his impulse when he's taking a portrait. Yeah, and it seems to be there about the ability of photography to reveal something which is unseen, which is quite a kind of peculiar idea, because on the one hand we're thinking about the camera as a mechanical device, yeah. something that's just reproducing yeah, reality. Yeah, it's it's real. Yeah. And that's something that's mostly associated with Deacon's photography, which you yeah. think about it as being very unordained, mm. as being very mm. straightforward. Mm. So this idea that it's revealing something mysterious or demonic goes back to much earlier thinking about photography, things like spirit photography mm. that's revealing these mm. kind of ghosts um, in yeah. the background. And in some ways these double exposures seem to kind of reveal that side of his mm. practice mm. and an interest in actually revealing the unseen or something on the other side of the mirror perhaps. Mm. Mm. I really like the idea of the double exposure expressing a double self, you know, mm. even the phrase, the etymology of the phrase becomes layered with meaning. Mm. The double exposure idea essentially does sit within that surrealist position, which I suppose was generated from Freudian analysis, which is that there's another self that can be exposed by applying certain techniques, and that the double exposure almost by its you know, very nature seems to really illustrate that concept in a very pure kind of way, that there are two selves, and by a certain process that's both mechanical and human, that this illustrates in a moment by a click. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that there's that way of looking at it, that it could be two images and one of them is more real or not than the other. But then mm -hmm. there's also this idea which sort of Sphere around Bacon are really engaging with around existentialism at this time, that you might have many faces and none of them are a genuine self. And, and that, that you could also you know, think yes. about these images, that actually they're all kind of a performance of a person. And if we're looking at somebody like, say, Muriel Belcher, who herself is kind of always on show, you know, when mm -hmm. she's described in the setting of the colony rooms as something mm. that's kind of constantly performing mm. for her group of people. It's quite interesting to think about it that way, that it's not necessarily revealing 
a more um, genuine or authentic self mm. by actually saying that that might yeah. not exist at all. And I was very interested in this image that, that we're looking at here, which is not related really to the circle around Bacon. I mean, it, it is tangentially because it's part of the art world itself at that time. But this photograph of Pagin Guggenheim, where it's definitely kind of demonstrating this idea that creative people have an inner life. They are working with the imagination and it's using the double exposure to kind of thematize that in some way. But it's difficult to look at this photograph without thinking about the biographical details of her life as well as somebody who struggled with depression, particularly because the pose itself is this kind of melancholic, leaning on the hand, but also then being surrounded by all of these kind of tools of the trade, of mm. brushes, pencils, and all of those kinds of things. So he's definitely kind of thinking about it not just as a kind of technical trick, but also one which is able to communicate something from it. And mm. here I think there's a very deliberate play with psychological states that's related quite explicitly to the sitter. I'd not really thought about it before, but the more I think about this image, and as you say, knowing a few biographical details of her that she's ultimately uh, committed suicide, I think, is that these brushes and the tools, as you say, are almost crowding her out. It's almost mm. like they're multiplying around her. I know that she struggled with the relationship with her mother, Peggy Guggenheim, that her mother didn't really support her artistic endeavours and never thought they were, uh, had any merit, which seems to be a fairly sort of almost become a standard trope of children mm. of famous or successful adults working in the same sphere as their parents. Even the pictures on the wall mm. and boxes of paint and the paper mm. is all actually coming up in her and, 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 and unsettling her. The studio that that's taken in, her studio in Paris, I think it was on the Ile de la Cité in the centre of Paris, was right at the top of a very tall building with loads of skylights and glass and windows and rickety balconies around her. It's quite an unusual composition compared to the others, which mm. are broadly centrally focused. Mm. They're photographs where the sitter is centred which again, you could relate back to some of Bacon's paintings, which often have this kind of bilateral symmetry that's then mm. thrown off through it, in which the double exposure plays with an idea mm. of, of symmetry, of mirroring, mm. but it's not ever really possible to get something that is that symmetrical. So mm. there's always something slightly unnerving about these images, where mm. they are slightly kind of off-centre, which seems to be deliberate and which of course relates back to Bacon's painting but is also used in sittings way outside of that circle. And some of them, as Deacon was saying in his treatise of eight portraits, he wanted to expose a demon in his sitters. Some of them actually do come across mm. as demonic, almost in the classic sense. I thought it was interesting that a double exposure photograph was used to promote the film about the possession the big film in the 70s. The Exorcist? The Exorcist, yeah. yeah. Which is, mm. you know, de facto a demon possession. It kind of links it straight through to, you know, that's more sort of gothic, sort of mm. like extreme, what, what uh, double exposure infers. The early years of photography, I suppose, around the late 1800s, when the tricks become formalised, I suppose, the access to these tricks become like specialised knowledge of the photographer in the fact that um, the general population, I suppose, wouldn't be aware that double exposure is anything other than mm. reality, a captured mm. reality, because mm. that's the narrative of the establishment of photography, that it uniquely manages to capture reality. So they were able to create, I suppose, a whole subgenre of spirit photography and capturing ghosts mm. and capturing dead people, which again ties into Deakin's kind of inference that he was capturing a demon in people when he took their portrait. I think these images are very interesting mid 20th century photographs which are really looking back to some of the origins of it for thinking about spiritualist photography, for thinking perhaps about motion capture and they seem to be really thinking about photography itself as a medium mm. as much as what's being captured in, in mm. the image.